Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and today we're discussing the uh, paper of Unit 3, January 2022 in the IAS uh, uh, Edexcel uh, syllabus. So let us take a look at the questions that they had in January 2022 and uh, how it can be answered. The first part says, answer all questions, write your answers in the spaces provided. This question is about ammonium chloride, a soluble ionic compound. An aqueous solution of ammonium chloride contains both ammonium ions and chloride ions. State what would be seen, remember when he says what would be seen or what is the observation, then you write what you see, not the name of something that is formed. So state what would be seen on the addition of acidified silver nitrate solution to an aqueous solution of ammonium chloride. So remember, silver nitrate is a test for what? It's a test for chloride. Now when I add silver nitrate to something that has chloride, like ammonium chloride, what am I supposed to see? I'm supposed to see a white precipitate forming white precipitate please do not write white solution or just white now describe a test to confirm the presence of ammonium ions now what was the test for ammonium ions the test for ammonium ions was add sodium hydroxide solution warm gently bubbles of gas are given off that turn damp red litmus to blue that is because it gives off ammonia gas. Another test that you could say is the one with uh, concentrated HCl. If you put a glass rod wet with concentrated HCl near the solution, it forms white smoke because ammonium chloride is formed. So what you see is white smoke. Okay, let's see what this question is asking. He says, a student investigated the enthalpy change when dissolving ammonium chloride in excess water. And the procedure is, he weighed 7.17 grams of ammonium chloride into a glass beaker, fill a 50 centimeter cube measuring cylinder with water, measure the temperature of the water, pour the water into the beaker, start a stopwatch, uh, stir the solution using the thermometer. Record the temperature at certain intervals. The data from the experiment are shown. So he already drew the graph for you. And he's saying, give two reasons why the student stared the solution in steps three and four. Why would we stir a solution? Remember that we stir it to dissolve the solid ammonium chloride and to ensure that there is an accurate temperature reading because that would distribute the heat evenly through the solution. So to dissolve the solid and to distribute the heat evenly so that the temperature that is read is an accurate temperature. Then he says, use the graph to determine the maximum temperature change in this experiment. Now, he shows you the graph and you should realize that the temperature started to decrease and then at some point it started to increase. And he wants to know the maximum temperature change. Well, you need to extrapolate that line as we did here and uh, find what was the temperature at zero and then the difference between them so he started at about 19.7 and when we extrapolated it it gives about 10.7 10 that means you have a maximum temperature change of 9 degrees Celsius another student carried out the experiment using a polystyrene cup remember he said he did it in a glass beaker but we are always supposed to do any experiment that has measuring of temperature. It should be done in a polystyrene cup. Now, this is, of course, to because the polystyrene is an insulator and it does not allow loss of heat to the environment. So the temperatures that will be measured will be more accurate. 
Now he says, explain how this student's graph would be different. You may annotate the graph as part of your answer. So if he uses a polystyrene cup, how would his graph be different? You should realize that that means that there will be no loss of heat to the environment. So there will be a greater temperature change. So a slower rise in temperature after 90 seconds because after 90 seconds it starts to go up again there will be a slower rise in temperature since there will be less heat absorbed from the surrounding the experimental results of another student were used in the equation shown and he's trying to get delta h so we know that delta H is Q over N, and he already tells me that the delta H is this value plus 14,500. First of all, um, you remember that when we do this equation, uh, what we're doing is we, we're saying Q is MC delta T, and we said M is the mass of the solution. And that means that when we do not include the mass of any solid that is in the reaction also you you have c as the specific heat capacity of water the specific heat capacity of water is a certain number here of course we're not using water we're using a solution of ammonium chloride so we are assuming that the specific heat capacity of the solution is the same as that of water so he's saying here state two assumptions made in this calculation you do not need to justify so we said we're assuming that the mass of the solution is the mass of water because the density we're assuming that the density of the solution is the same as that of water we are assuming that the specific heat capacity of the solution is the same as that of just water and that means we are also assuming that the mass of the solid is negligible compared to that of the solution. So any two of these would be a correct answer. Here he's saying the total percentage uncertainty in this experiment was 2.6%. Show that the enthalpy change of this number is consistent with a data book value of 14.8. Now. That means that I need to calculate what is the 2.6% of this number. Add that to the number to show that this is consistent with the data book value. So it comes out about the same number. This question is about two organic compounds, X and Y. Both are liquids which contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen only. The mass of hydrogen and carbon present in 1.33 grams of X were determined by passing its combustion products through the apparatus shown. Can you see the apparatus? So he has X, 1.33 grams of X, and he's passing pure oxygen through it. Then whatever comes out from the complete combustion, which should be carbon dioxide and water vapor, are absorbed the water vapor is absorbed by the silica gel and the carbon dioxide is absorbed by the soda line so first thing he says state the measurements that should be made what do you think we should measure in this case we need the initial and final mass of each youtube and its contents because i want to know the uh, silica gel absorbed how much and the soda lime absorbed how much now, give two reasons why pure oxygen and not air should be used. Remember that air has carbon dioxide and water. So if I pass air through it, that would also be uh, absorbed by the substances in the YouTube. So it will not give an accurate uh, measurement of the masses. So this, um, you cannot pass through carbon dioxide and water in the air at the beginning. And of course, if we give it pure oxygen, then that means that it will have enough oxygen for complete combustion of the compound. So he wants two reasons. Then he says the experiment showed that 1.33 grams of X contains this mass of hydrogen and this mass of carbon. Calculate the empirical formula. Remember how to calculate empirical formula? 
First of all, at the beginning, he said it has carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. So you need to get the oxygen. So the mass of the oxygen is the rest of the 1.33 grams. Then he says, calculate the empirical formula. This is how we calculate the empirical formula. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, you write the masses of each one. And the first thing you do is divide by what? By the mass number of each one. So the carbon by 12, hydrogen by 1, oxygen by 16. Whatever comes out, I divide by the smallest. So these are the numbers that you get. And when you divide them by the smallest, you get 1.5. And we said the 1.5 is not rounded up or down. You write it as 1.5. This is 1.5 to 4 to 1. And we said if we have anything in the middle, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, we need to multiply by a certain number that will give whole numbers. You have to write the final empirical formula. Don't leave the numbers hanging there. The final answer is C3H8O2. Then he says, when phosphorus chloride is added to X, a steamy white, fume, uh, steamy white fumes are seen. Uh, do you remember the phosphorus pentachloride was a test for what? It will give steamy white fumes of HCl when you add it to something that has OH. So it will react if you have an alcohol or a carboxylic acid, something that has an OH in it. So this means it contains OH, and that means X is either an alcohol or a carboxylic acid. Then he says, compound X is converted into compound Y when refluxed with excess sodium dichromate. Now, excess sodium dichromate, what does the sodium dichromate do? It is an oxidizing agent. It oxidizes any primary alcohols to acids or if there is a secondary alcohol it will give a ketone so he's saying this gives me compound y first of all draw a label diagram of the apparatus that could be used to separate y we said if we do a complete um, oxidation and we want to separate y we use a distillation apparatus you have to label the distillation apparatus especially where does water go in and what where does water go out remember that water goes in from the bottom and out from the top uh, you heat the flask you must have a thermometer and you must have a receiving uh, flask that is not totally closed so it must be uh, something that is open from one side so that opening at the end allows any excess gases and prevents any um, accumulation of pressure inside the upper then he gives you the ir spectrum of y he says this is the ir spectrum of y and he's saying he gives you a table and remember that he usually gives you a table or you have it in the data booklet now he's saying explain how the spectrum shows that y contains a carboxylic acid functional group coating data from the table remember that if it has carboxylic acid that means you should have a peak for the oh and a peak for the c double bond o so let's look at the spectrum yes there is a peak for the oh can you see where the peak for the oh is around 3000 and something and the peak for c double bond o around 1700 and something so the peak for the OH is about 3300 to 2500. That is the OH for the carboxylic acids, and a peak at about uh, 1740 to 1680 for the C double bond O. A spectrum of Y, you have to remember for unit three and actually for unit two also, uh, you have to remember what we said in unit one about mass spectrum. So this is the mass spectrum of Y, and he's saying show that the mass spectrum is consistent with Y having the molecular formula C3H4O3. What do we see in a mass spectrum? You remember that the mass spectrum, you look at the peak with the highest M over Z, that is what we call 
the molecular ion peak, that should be equal to the MR of the compound. So you calculate the MR of this compound, it comes out to be 88. Do we have a peak for 88? Yes. So the mass spectrum has a molecular ion peak at M over Z 88. So that is consistent with the fact that it could be C3H4O3. Then he says, so just the structure of the ion causing the peak at 43. Remember that the peak at 43 is what we call the base peak or the highest percentage uh, abundance. So what do you think this is due to? It, remember that all of these peaks are due to uh, fractions of the molecule, breaking up of the molecules. So something at 43, you have to calculate which part could give you 43. You should realize C it CH3CO plus, please, there is a plus up there. Uh, remember that all the uh, peaks are due to positive ions. You cannot say any, write anything without the positive charge. So it is due to this part. If you calculate the MR of that part, it is 43. So he's saying compound X contains one functional group. Compound Y contains two functional groups. Use all the information that we have been talking about to determine the structures of X and Y. What did we say about X? We said X is C3H8O2. So it's something that has three hydrogens, uh, three carbons, eight hydrogens, and two oxygen. It has an OH, so it must be an alcohol. But if you have two uh, oxygens, that means you have two alcohols. So that could be the structure of X. Compound Y is C3H4O3. It is made by oxidation of alcohol, so it is an acid. And it has this part, CH3CO+. Well, what do you think this could be? Then this is the structure. Okay? A student used a precipitation titration to determine the value of X in the formula of the sample. Uh, hydrated barium chloride, BACL2, X water. So we're trying to get the X. And he's saying, prepare a solution by dissolving 1.57 grams of the compound in water, making the solution up to a mark of 250. So he put the 1.57 grams in 250 volumetric flask. Mix thoroughly. Use a pipette to transfer. So we took 10 of that 250 into a conical flask. He added excess sodium sulfate, so he's reacting the barium chloride with the sodium sulfate. Fill a burette with a certain concentration of silver nitrate. Add three drops potassium chromate solution and titrate the contents. In this case, the potassium chromate is actually used as an indicator because it will give a certain color. While swirling with the silver nitrate solution, the end point is shown by appearance of a permanent pale red precipitate. So he's reacting whatever is in the flask with the chromate. At the end, it will react with the, the silver nitrate, will react with the chromate and give a red precipitate. So it's acting as an indicator. Repeat steps two and four until concordant results are obtained. During the titration, two precipitation reactions occur. And he's saying the first reaction that happens is silver ions react with chloride ions to form silver chloride. And you know that silver chloride gives you a white precipitate. And then after that, once all the chloride has been used up, any more silver nitrate that you add from the burette will react with the chromate in the solution and give the other precipitate. Give the ionic equation for the reaction that occurs when sodium sulfate solution is added to the conical flask in step two. Again, he added the sodium sulfate to what? He added the sodium sulfate to barium chloride. You have to remember how we do ionic equation. So this is the normal equation. You write a normal balanced equation. And then we said we ionize anything that is aqueous. If I have a solid, liquid, or gas, it is not ionized. So ionize it, put the number of positives or negatives depending on its charge. So this is what you get when you ionize it. The barium sulfate comes down 
as it is because it's solid otherwise everything is ionized and then you look at what ions are uh, the same on both sides of the arrow the ions that are the same on both sides of the arrow are the 2Na plus and 2Cl minus so what are you left with you're left with the barium ions plus sulfate ions to give the barium sulfate he says include state symbols so do not forget to include the state symbols then he says give a possible reason why it is necessary to add sodium sulfate solution we're adding the sodium sulfate to remove the barium ions at the beginning because if i leave the barium ions they will form a precipitate with the chromate ions so we're removing the barium ions so that when we titrate it with the silver nitrate it is reacting only with the chloride and the chromate that we added. So just why the red precipitate of silver chromate only forms after all the chloride ions have reacted, that means, you remember that as I add the silver nitrate, it should be reacting with both. But the chloride, the silver chloride precipitate that is formed is uh, very insoluble. The silver chromate that will form during the titration is soluble and it will not appear until um, all the chloride has been used up. So that means that the silver chloride precipitate is less soluble than silver chromate. Then he gives you a data table and he gives you numbers and he says complete the table and use the concordant results to calculate the mean titer. So the mean titer, of course, is the difference between final and initial. So you just subtract uh, the final minus the initial for each one. And then you look at these titers. What do we mean by concordant results? Remember that we said concordant results are results that are within 0.2 of each other. So what, which, which of these have a difference of less than 0.2? Of course, the 16.15 is way away from all of these. But the 15.9, 15.8, that's a difference of 0.1. 15.8, 15.85, it's a difference of 0.05. So these three numbers are within 0.2 of each other. So these are concordant results. So when you calculate the mean or the average, you include only the ones that are concordant. You do not include that first result, which is obviously wrong. And uh, of course, the average is you add them up and divide by three. And then he says, determine the value of X in this formula using all the information that you have had. Okay, what do we have? We have 1.57 grams of this was put in 250 centimeter cube solution and then we have silver nitrate we said we took 10 10 of this solution and we titrated with uh, silver nitrate with a certain concentration and we got a certain volume of the silver nitrate so this is what we have okay what's the first thing we should do get the number of moles of silver nitrate of course this is a solution so we number of moles is concentration times volume you multiply them, you get a certain number of moles. And then you look at the equation. The equation says one mole of silver reacts with one mole of chloride. That means that the number of moles of chloride is the same as the number of moles of silver nitrate. Then compare them to the barium chloride. Now we have barium chloride gives one mole of barium ions and two moles of chloride ions that means if i have the number of moles of chloride ions the number of moles of the barium chloride is half of that can you see that then he these are the number of moles of barium chloride in 10 centimeter cubed remember that he did it and took only 10 and did titration so the number of moles of barium chloride that you have are actually the number of moles in 10 centimeter cubed so how much in 250 so the number of moles in 250 is that number i do it by cross multiplication depends on what you you do with math but uh, we do it cross multiplication the number of moles times 250 over 10 
So that gives me a certain number of moles of the barium chloride, which is the same as the number of moles of the hydrated form, barium chloride X water. Now, the MR, how do I get MR from all of this? Well, the MR is mass over number of moles. So the mass of the 1.57 over the number of moles we just calculated, that gives me an MR. Okay, this is the MR of everything. Barium chloride X water. That means the, uh, the mass number of barium plus two times the mass number of chlorine plus 18X is this number. So solving for X, you get that X equals two. So that means that the formula was BACL2, 2, 1. Okay, this next question says it is about the preparation of anhydrous aluminum chloride, which reacts vigorously with water, so we don't want water in the apparatus, and it must be stored in tightly sealed containers. A sample of anhydrous aluminum chloride was prepared by passing chlorine gas over hot aluminum. So basically, the reaction we're doing is aluminum plus chlorine to give aluminum chloride. And this is the apparatus that he's using. The procedure says, assemble the apparatus with about 5 grams of potassium manganate. Can you see where the potassium manganate is? It's in the pear-shaped flask at the bottom. 10 centimeter cubed of concentrated hydrochloric acid in the tap funnel. And a known mass of aluminium foil in the combustion tube. Can you see all of this? Carefully open the tap of the funnel, allowing the acid to enter the pear-shaped flask drop by drop. Wait for 20 seconds. Now, he said that the, con the reaction of the concentrated hydrochloric acid with the potassium manganate, this is what gives chlorine gas. So, basically, he's doing this to get chlorine gas. Then, heat the aluminium foil until it glows brightly. Continue heating until the reaction is complete. So, now you're passing the chlorine gas over the heated aluminium. Allow the apparatus to cool before closing the tap of the funnel. Remove the receiver bottle. Can you see where the receiver bottle is? Quickly scrape the product into a sample tube and seal with a lid. Okay. Granules of anhydrous calcium chloride are held between two ceramic wool plugs. Do you remember the, this was the diagram? He says, granules of anhydrous calcium chloride. Can you see the anhydrous calcium chloride in the diagram? It is placed between ceramic wool plugs in the combustion tube. Explain the purpose of anhydrous calcium chloride. You have to remember that when we use anhydrous calcium chloride in any experiment, it is to absorb water. It is a substance that absorbs water from the atmosphere or whatever we're working with. So we want to absorb water and because he said at the beginning of the experiment, that the aluminium chloride uh, would react with water if we had any water around it. So we want to absorb water so that it does not react with the aluminium chloride that we're trying to form. Then he says, give the reason why granules of anhydrous calcium chloride are used rather than powder. Granules means pieces of anhydrous calcium chloride why is he using pieces and not powder? Remember that we said the uh, anhydrous calcium chloride is there to absorb water. But at the same time, I want the chlorine gas that we're forming to pass over aluminium. So the granules will allow the chlorine gas to pass through. Then the reaction occurring in step two produces chlorine. Identify the main hazard related to chlorine gas, giving the best way of minimizing the risk. Remember that when we're working in an experiment that has chlorine gas in it, or actually any gases, usually some of the gases are toxic, or chlorine gas, for example, is toxic. So the best way to do the experiment would be to do it in a fume cupboard. Remember what's a fume cupboard? That is something that is usually in the lab. It has a door and it is attached to a chimney or 
some sort of uh, apparatus that sucks up the gases so that we do not breathe in any gas. Remember that chlorine gas is poisonous. So we have to do the experiment in a fume cup. Give a reason why the concentrated hydrochloric acid is added drop by drop to the pear-shaped flask. Remember that he was saying that we're going to add the concentrated hydrochloric acid to the potassium manganate in the pear-shaped flask drop by drop. Remember that we're doing this to produce chlorine gas. So if I add all the concentrated hydrochloric acid immediately, what will happen? The chlorine gas will form very quickly. So we're adding it drop by drop to control the rate of the reaction so that the gas is not produced too quickly so that it doesn't bubble out, it doesn't do any kind of explosion and so on. So just why the heating of aluminium in step three is delayed by 20 seconds, he said. I do the reaction of concentrated hydrochloric acid with potassium manganate, allow it to form chlorine gas, wait for 20 seconds, and then start heating the aluminium so that the chlorine gas will react to the aluminium. Why are we doing this? Remember that this is to allow the chlorine to displace the air so that it pushes out any air from the apparatus and that means i don't want any oxygen to react with the aluminium state how you would know the reaction is complete in step three remember that he said when he starts the experiment the aluminium starts glowing so how will i know that the reaction is complete when the aluminium stops glow so just the purpose of the potassium hydroxide in the absorption tube, at the end there was potassium hydroxide. This is to absorb any unreacted chlorine gas. Remember that chlorine gas is actually acidic, so it would be absorbed by any base. This is to prevent the chlorine gas from escaping from the apparatus. Okay, I hope that this was useful review for you, and um, please continue. Uh, listening. Thank you.